Welcome to Stories from Palestine podcast, a podcast recorded in Palestine and about Palestine. My name is Crystal. I studied history and tour guiding, and I live in Palestine with my Palestinian husband and children. I started this podcast during the COVID pandemic in the summer of 2020. And now that tourism is slowly coming back to Palestine, I will continue the podcast bi-weekly. So subscribe on your podcast player and turn on the notifications if you want to be reminded of new episodes. You can also follow Stories from Palestine on Facebook and Instagram, where I will share a virtual soundbite of each new episode. As we are approaching to the Christmas, and I attended the Christmas tree lighting here in Beit Sahur the other day, I started to realize that there are a lot of people who are not aware that there are Christian Palestinians, because when I posted something on my Instagram page, people were kind of surprised to realize that we celebrate Christmas in Bethlehem. And then I said, well, Bethlehem is the place where Jesus was born. So of course, there are people who are celebrating Christmas in Bethlehem. And yes, they do set up Christmas trees and they do have Christmas decorations. And I guess every family celebrates Christmas with their families and go to the church. So I thought to have an episode just before Christmas about Christian Palestinians or Palestinian Christians. We will uh, talk about that too, about identity. And I'm sitting here with Yusuf Ghouri. Actually, your last name means priest, I think. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Exactly. So that's interesting. And you were one of my teachers at the Bethlehem Bible College when I studied for the tour guide program. So I learned a lot about Christianity and about the church history from you. So I thought you'll be the best person to share that with the podcast listeners. But before we dive into that topic, can you introduce yourself and tell us a bit where you are from? How did you end up here? <laughs> because yeah. that's also a story. And what did you do in life and what do you do right now? My name is Yusuf al Khuri, which means Joseph the priest. It gives a little hint about my heritage, which I'm a 43rd generation of my family. 36 generations of my family were in the priesthood of the Oriental Orthodox Church in Palestine. So when people actually get to ask me for how long you've been Christian, I literally tell them that my bedroom was built around, I think, the 4th century, the end of the 4th century. So it's been a long, long time since we followed uh, Christ, I would say, and became Christian. Um, originally, as I said, from Gaza, I moved to the West Bank, Bethlehem, due to the political tension in my hometown in 2007. I attended Bethlehem Bible College where I got my bachelor degree in biblical studies and Christian education. And it's where I met my wife too. And I got married in 2011. I have a master's of divinity in theology and missions from the United States of America and currently working on my doctorate in the Netherlands. Wonderful country. <laughs> You're going to have a lot of fun. Not now uh, make an argument about it. No. <laughs> I need it. <laughs> yeah. So if anybody in the Netherlands wants to meet Yusuf after hearing this podcast episode, you can from next year onwards. And if you have a place to live, <laughs> he's still looking for an apartment to rent. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Um, so it's exciting, actually. It will be, uh, I think, uh, a cultural experience as much as um, university and educational. Joe, yeah. I'm excited. Yeah. And looking forward, actually, to meet some of your uh, listeners. Yeah, for sure. That's going to be interesting. If they hear this and they want to meet up with you, they can definitely do that and have some more interesting conversations mm -hmm. and maybe show you around. And then eventually they can come to Palestine in the future and you can show them around here. This is how we do it. We can make some deals. Yusuf, I mentioned that Palestinian Christian or Christian Palestinian, and this has something to do with identity because eventually the Christians now are a minority. Do you know how many Christians live around here? Where do they live? So in Palestine, in the Palestinian territory, Palestinian Christians are around 45,000. And I would assume that Bethlehem has roughly around 25,000 Palestinian Christian. In Gaza, my hometown, the number of Christians has been dwindling massively. I believe the Christian population in Gaza is roughly 700 people nowadays. So Bethlehem remains 
the major Christian hub for Palestinians in, in the West Bank. Yeah. And where in other towns in the West Bank can we find Christians? You can find Christians in East Jerusalem. Uh, Ramallah has um, Christian families. And the long history of Ramallah was built around the Christian families. The north around Nablus and Janine also remains Christian families and a small community. Small villages here and there, I would say, small population, maybe 100 families or even less. And can we talk about Christian Palestinian or Palestinian Christian? What comes first? What comes next about identity? That's a very important question because usually we think of identity as a simple matter, but it's very complex. It's a social construct that keeps evolving and being more complicated. For Palestinian Christians or Christian Palestinians, it's not about what comes first, but it's part of the complexity of their identity. So myself, I would identify as a Palestinian Arabic Christian because Palestine is my country, Arab is my language, and my uh, heritage uh, when it comes to the long history we lived here, the language and the culture we have adopted and carried on, and Christianity is my faith. These are not three contradictory or competing parts of my identity. Actually, they are complementary. Maybe we can talk a little bit about the history of Christianity in Palestine. And it's going to be a little lecture maybe from you. But for people who have no idea how Christianity started, when it started and how it developed. I mean, sometimes when I tell people that Jesus was a Jew, mm -hmm. they are very already very confused. So... Uh, this is the land here where we are now, Palestine, where it all started. But Jesus wasn't a Christian. I mean, Jesus was a Jew. So how how did we get from there to here? Can you take us a bit through the church history? Wow. Uh, <laughs> for how long? <laughs> I remember we had a whole class, a course, <laughs> over 15 weeks of doing that. But um, simply put, yes, Jesus was a, a Palestinian Jew who lived under the Roman Empire and occupation of Palestine. And he experienced firsthand the occupation and its brutality. You remember that when Jesus was born in Bethlehem, Herod the Great, who was ruling the country, when he heard that there is a king of the Jew was born in Bethlehem, he went and killed all the children of Bethlehem who were two years and younger. And according to the scripture and the tradition, Jesus and his family had to migrate to Egypt. They became refugees. And later when they heard the news, Joseph and Mary, when they heard the news that Herod the Great died, they returned to Palestine. And they moved to the hometown of Joseph and Mary, mostly in the Galilee, Nazareth. So Christianity from the beginning is a Palestinian Jewish religion. Jesus didn't come and preach Christianity or teach Christianity. Jesus didn't come and he had a Bible in his hand giving out to the people. Because according to the Christian faith and theology, Jesus is actually the Word of God. It's not written, but is incarnated in the Word. And I think there are many beautiful scriptures we can read, especially in John, the Gospel of John, the first chapter, when he talks about the eternity of Jesus Christ as a one with God who became a flesh in order to live among the people. And the word that is used for this term is very important, I think, because it talks about the identity and it talks about the humanity of Jesus as a person, God becoming a person. In Arabic, it says that he came and dwelt among us, right? In English, sorry. He came and dwelled among us. And the word dwelt is not only that he occupied a place, but he embodied everything. I have a Dutch friend who taught me a new term related into that, that Jesus not only incarnated, but he's, he's taking the increation in himself. He didn't only become man, but he also, or human, but he also became part of the culture and civilization with all it means in Palestine. And I think that's what attracted people to Jesus. You know, it was very easy for him, it sounds, from the Gospels, that people followed him, listened to him, because he was 
approachable. He spoke the language they spoke. He talked about the concerns that they had. And of course, we know that Jesus was crucified for preaching the good news, for being anti-imperial. And some people think that it's uh, Jesus is a political person and figure, and that's not true. Jesus was political. Whenever he preached the kingdom of God, there is a threat to the empire of Caesar. And that's why he was crucified. Yes, for the, um, the spiritual sins of humanity and people, but also for the structural sense of the empire and the society. And his disciples carried on with the good news. We want to create an alternative society where people are equal, treated with dignity and with love and care. And that was the first core of his disciples in the first century. They cared for the orphans, they cared for the widows, for, for the poor. But I think if we can just notice something very important in this part. In the day of Pentecost, which Christians celebrate as the remembrance when the Holy Spirit came on the disciples in Jerusalem, we notice that it was the same day that the Arabic Christian church was born. If you read the book of Acts, chapter 2, verse 11, you'll find that Arab people were in Jerusalem celebrating the festival of the weeks, which means that they were Arab Jewish in Jerusalem in the first century, which makes us assume safely, according to the scripture, Acts 2, that those people converted to Christianity or accepted the Jewish Christ, and they went to their home countries and they preached the good news, and they created disciples and churches. So whenever people ask about the Palestinian Arab church or Arabic church, I would say it was born actually in the first day with the rest of the churches in the world. And they keep to growing and moving. Unfortunately, in the history books, what we see is the Western church. And there is a huge gap in our history of the church in the East. But the church in the East flourished and grew. And they had schools theological schools and institutions, such as in Palestine, right? You have Marsaba, you have Ibn Abayd, and other schools in the East, such as Edessa, which were centers of Christianity in the first five centuries. Unfortunately, when we think of Christianity, we, we try to carry modern terminologies and apply it to people in the first five centuries, like national, ethno-religious identities and terminologies, which is not true. In fact, people are surprised when they learn that Greek became the language of liturgy only around the 5th century. So 500 years later almost that Greek became the language of the church. But the church for 500 years was very inclusive. People would pray and use whatever language they use in their nation and home countries. And you can see it in the scriptures that churches were called after their cities and hometowns and the language that, that people have spoken. And later the church became part of the, the empire, unfortunately, let's say, in the fourth century. Christianity wasn't um, persecuted anymore. Of course, when you have uh, the Byzantine emperor, Constantine, and he made the decree that Christianity now is becoming the religion of the empire in 313 AD. And since then, Oriental Christianity, Oriental Orthodox Christianity became part of the ruling party, which made it more privileged and expand uh, in the Orient. And that's why I can say, oh yes, my bedroom in Gaza was built around the 4th century because of the Byzantine Empire. Mm -hmm. But of course, you can see the gap from almost the medieval time up to the Ottoman period where there is a complete neglection of the Oriental Church. Only when we hear about the great schism between the West and the East, especially the Catholic and the Orthodox churches in 1054 AD. But Palestinian Christians and Arab Christians, they didn't only survive that period, but they flourished as well. Because we can see writings between Palestinian and Arab theologians and the Muslim Khalifas. Palestinian theologian, his name Jeris Khouri, wrote a wonderful book about Arab Christians, about their history and heritage and dialogue with, with Muslim scholars and Muslim Khalifas. 
in the medieval times. But if you go move forward, as Palestinian Christians existed in Palestine for 2,000 years. They considered themselves as a legitimate guardians of the holy sites, of the place where Jesus was born, where Jesus walked and ministered to people, where the first apostles also lived. So it's fascinating when we are denied that history, especially with the coming of the English or British mandate on Palestine after World War I and the collapse of the Ottoman Empire. We were denied our very existence, especially by the Zionist movement and the British mandate authority. And Palestinian Christians suffered the displacement of 1948. Actually, 50,000, almost 50,000 Christians were displaced in 1948. They were taken out, uprooted from their hometowns. And one of them was my grandmother, my maternal grandmother, who is not allowed even to visit her hometown anymore. She's 84 years old, and um, she cannot even visit her hometown, which she left 74 years ago. Where was she originally from? From Yaffa. She went to Tarasanta Catholic School, and in 1948, they had to flee to Gaza because of the Zionist militia mass cars. This was committed on the coastal line of Palestine and near Jerusalem villages. So when they got the news in 1948, they had to flee. Yeah, I guess it's Palestinian Christians have gone through different waves of empires that ruled the land under which they had to survive sometimes. There were times where it was easier than other times. I think that a lot of people abroad may think that Christians struggle a lot with Islam here. Mm -hmm. So maybe we can talk, because there is a lot of things I want to talk about. But maybe first, how is the relationship with Christians and Muslims in Palestine and also over the the centuries? If we look at the first time that Muslims Mm -hmm. came to rule the land in 638, Omar ibn Mm al-Khattab arrived to Jerusalem... How did they deal with the majority Christian population in that time and and maybe after that also in other times where Christians were not ruling the land? Yes, I think it's very important to highlight two points. First, that Palestine has been under constant colonialism for so, so long, almost 3,000 years. And I would consider Islam as one of them because the Byzantines were colonials and the Islams later became and became colonial and continued till the Israeli settler colonialism. So it's one of the colonial stages of Palestinian history. And for example, Muslims actually, when they came and occupied Palestine in the 7th century, they didn't settle in Palestine. It's still almost the 10th century or 11th century that we get to see Muslim community growing in Palestine. And Christians actually negotiated their coexistence with their Muslim neighbors and new colonizer for so long to the point that some Christians actually converted to Islam. And here how Islam became part of the mixture of Palestinian heritage and history. The second point I make, Crystal, is, let me ask you a question. Do you have arguments with Tariq? About religion? No, just in general. Oh, yeah, we do have sometimes, yeah. (laughs) So, I assume any couple who live in the same house, they would have an argument, Mm. and sometimes fights, might get violent in a certain way, but you're still a couple, still committed to live with one another, right? Mm. And I believe Christians and Muslims are a couple. We have a shared heritage and history. At the same time, we are married to one another and we have to figure out how we work it out. I don't say that Palestinian Christians are persecuted. At the same time, I don't say that Palestinian Christians are privileged. And I think we share the same struggle of living under settler colonialism. And Israel doesn't treat Christians better than Muslims. We are all Palestinians for them. And Muslims understand this very well and Christians too. We get into arguments and I think that's part of life. We have to find our way through those arguments without trying to exploit the other party locally and globally. I like Mitri Rahib, who is a Palestinian theologian and Lutheran pastor, who wrote about the politics of persecution. 
and how sometimes the West is trying to use Palestinian Christians and talk about Islamic persecution to promote the Islamophobia narrative of the West. And I'm glad that a Palestinian who wrote about this, a Palestinian Christian clergy and a scholar who wrote about this, mm -hmm. to show that persecution is not something that we experience in Palestine from our Muslim neighbors. Mm -hmm. It's actually from the settler colonialism of Israel. Yeah, I also was thinking about the arrival of the Islam and there was actually some pacts between Sophronius, the yes. patriarch of Jerusalem, with Omar ibn al-Khattab about how the Christians would be treated. And they were considered people of the book mm. by Muslims. So they they, yeah, they had to pay maybe some extra taxes, but they were able to, to live their life and to believe what they believed. But then in the history of Palestine, you have the period of the Crusaders. Mm. So this is interesting. There are Christians coming in from Europe who took their Christianity from the East, but then somehow developed that over mm. time and then came back to Jerusalem to mm. liberate it from the Muslims. And then what happened? Because these are Western Christians and they all of a sudden they meet Arab Christians in Jerusalem. Mm. Was there a positive <laughs> encounter? Or? I think we can also use two points to answer your question. First of all, the Omar Pact was a good agreement for that time between Christians and Muslims, although it had many points, were very abusive of Christians. Christians were discriminated against by the Omar Pact and the Muslim occupation of Palestine, colonialism in Palestine in the 7th century. So we cannot keep carrying that over to 21st century and use it uh, in Palestine as a reference at least because we can create much more egalitarian society when it comes to religion and ethnicity and backgrounds. That's first. But of course, that pact at least, at least protected the Christians for a certain time from the power of coloniality of the Muslim empire in the first few centuries. Because not all Muslims were Omar. And I think Omar was very smart. He knew that if he dies he doesn't know who will follow him and how they will interact with Christians. The second thing, which is very important, I believe, to think about, the Crusaders, when they came to Palestine, although to some extent we cannot neglect some of them, they had the sincere desire and they thought that they are liberating the religious sides from the Muslim occupiers and colonizers. But how it turned against even the Christian community in Palestine, you can read it through history, that actually the Crusaders played a major part in the declining of Christianity in Palestine. And around that time, in the, in the medieval centuries, especially if we talk about the 11th and 12th up to the 13th century, even some Crusades murdered Christians in Jerusalem. I believe one of the stories talks about how a blood of Orthodox Christians or Oriental Orthodox churches was up to the knees of people because the Crusaders killed Christians. So religion has always been used to justify war, violence, and colonialism. And it was used to justify the Crusaders. Going back to not so long ago, like last century, we see that the Ottoman Empire opens up its doors basically for foreign influences. There's more embassies are being uh, established and also more institutions. And then we see an influx of evangelical Christians coming in from Europe and from the United States. And I think that is also the time when we start to see different church communities here because I guess the denominations that we find here more naturally is the Greek Orthodox and then the Catholic mm. but then now you also have Lutheran churches and Baptists and Evangelical and even I, I know some Jehovah Witnesses mm. so that is something that happened only over the last century. Can you say something about that? How did that change the Palestinian Christian community and do you consider it as a positive thing or is this also a kind of colonization maybe of the religion? Wow. Yes, I think it's very important to know that the Catholic Church and the rest of the denominations only arrived to Palestine and they built churches about 200 years ago. So for 1800 years, 
the Oriental Church was the really dominant church in Palestine. And even they considered Catholics as colonizers, right? We know that Catholicism left some remnants after the Crusaders in Palestine, but to institute as a church, it was only about 150, 200 years ago. So in the sight of some Orthodox Christians, these are foreigners to us. Like this Catholicism is not something genuine Palestinian as theirs. They see it that way in to some people, I would say. For Protestant and evangelical missions who came to Palestine in the late 1800s, the 19th century, they came with this Orientalist view that, you know, those people of the East are illiterate and they are like need to convert to, to Christianity. They need to be saved with this whole idea of, of mission and sending out, but comes with Orientalist view. And they thought that Palestine is only like a empty barren land. And sometimes for them, the emptiness and bareness of the land, not because there were no people here, but because there were people who don't carry the same values of theirs. I like when Penn White, who's a British journalist, said, for those British Orientalists, not about the existence of a people, but of a people of same value. And that's, I think, very crucial point to make here. So those churches who came to Palestine, some of them actually came with the intent of converting Jews to Christianity because there were Jews in Palestine in the 1800s. I think roughly around 33,000 Jewish Palestinians lived in this country. And they wanted to have their imperial installment in Palestine and especially in Jerusalem. They want to have the portion of the holy city. So you get to see that the Anglicans started, followed the Lutherans. Around the 1890, you get to see the first start of evangelical arrival to Palestine. I think it was 1892, the first evangelical church arrival to Jerusalem and starting their own church. Before that, there weren't really serious works and initiatives. Do we see them as a colonizers? To some extent, yes, especially when they promote Zionist ideology, and they are themselves Christian Zionists, and they would identify as such. Can't just ignore what Joe Biden, the president of the U.S., said when he visited Jerusalem a couple of months ago, that he said that I am a Christian Zionist. So Christian Zionism is a real thing, or Zionist Christianity is a real thing, and people who prefer Zionist ideology over their Christian faith, because these are not a complementary religion and ideology. These are actually contradictory to one another. One is more about peace, love, reconciliation, justice, and the other is about colonization and greed, about war and hate. I think that you will have to explain us a little bit more about this because I think people always connect Zionism to Jewish Zionism, now you're talking about Christian Zionism. So what is that and what do they believe? Yes, so Zionism actually, and some might be surprised, started with the Christian theologians and thinkers. In the mid-1800s, we see that some British or English theologians start talking about those ideas which constituted later the Zionist ideology such as a land without people for a people without land. That's not actually a, a Zionist, a Jewish Zionist statement. It was made by um, a British theologian, English theologian, in 1854. Lord Shaftesbury, he made it very clear, using biblical passage, in order to justify sending the Jews. And he, here I'm using this, these terminologies very carefully and quoting him back to Palestine. And later, we see that Theodore Herzl and the Zionist movement in its early stages didn't consider Palestine. They weren't religious Jews. They were secular. Some of them were atheists, even, who believed later that God gave them the land. That's the funny part about it. You know, it can be an atheist and God promises you something. And the reason that Herzl and his group adopted Palestine and this narrative because of Christians they are the one who promoted and made it a more compelling argument for Herzl 
to promote Palestine as a homeland for the Jews. And that comes out of a theological fantasies of some churches and denominations and theologies in the West related to the end times. So Zionism is about the occupation of Palestine and using the Bible to justify it. And for the Christians, using the Bible and the end times theology to justify it and make it happen. So for Christian Zionists, they want to expedite Jesus' second coming. Unfortunately, this ideology has been and is still very powerful in the West. Some statistics say that 80% of evangelicals in the U.S. and North America believe that Israel is a fulfillment of biblical prophecies and they support the state of Israel based on the Bible. And I think our issue is not with the Bible, but how they interpret the Bible and colonial mentality. It's been like that for centuries, and it still applies on Palestine. So that's Christian theology translated to Zionism. And we get to see the official impact of Christian Zionism around the 1967 with the Six Days War. Because you get to see on the Western news that David against Goliath, right? The Israelites defeat the Philistines. And using these 3,000 years old or 4,000 years old biblical texts and just copy-paste on the Israeli colonialism of Palestine. And that's how they created the confusion about the state of Israel. And they still enforce that. A last note here, I just need to make it very clear, that Zionism is ideology that is not only adopted by Christians, but also now we have Muslim Zionists. That's people. new for me. <laughs> yes, and they use the Quran to justify the existence of the state of Israel. And I think many of the Arab states who normalized relationships with Israel in the past three or four years, they used the Quran and they used the uh, Muslim imams and religious leaders to justify their political agenda. So Zionism not anymore is about uh, Jewish people or Israelis or Christians. It's also expandable to other people who support the existence of the state of Israel as a colonial state. But just also, I will make a, a last very important point. We need to distinguish between Zionism, Israelism, and Judaism. Not all Jews are Zionists. Actually, some neighborhoods in Jerusalem, if you walk and you say that this is the land of Israel, Jewish people would tell you, no, this is the land of Palestine. Mm -hmm. I remember living in the States in 2018, I believe, there was a huge ultra-Orthodox Jewish march for the freedom of Palestine. So not all Jews are Zionists, and we need to be very clear about this. Zionism is a colonial ideology that sometimes uses religion to justify it. Israelism, which is, if we take it to the state, the modern state of Israel, some of them actually are even not Zionists. Some of the Israelis are not Zionists. You have Palestinians who carry Israeli citizenship. They consider themselves Israelis. And you have Christians, Russians, East Europeans, who migrated to Palestine and they became Israeli citizens. They are Israelis, but they are not Zionists. At the same time, as we said about Judaism, Israelism, and Zionists can be a Muslim, Jewish, Christian, and carry that ideology. And honestly, now Christian Zionists are more in number than Jewish Zionists. Wow. So this is one of the big challenges, I guess, for Christian Palestinians is that you relate maybe to other Christians in your religion, in your love for Jesus, and in your love for God, in the way that you believe that you should live. But then that there's this one really important point that you have to struggle with them about because they say that all the Jewish people should come and live in Israel and basically replace you mm. where you are living. So have there been any initiatives to, to counter that or to educate Christians on that? Yes, but let me give you one important statement was made by Anglican bishop in Tiberias and uh, Lebanon in the 1940s. And he writes back to his denomination in England that the Palestinian Christian feel betrayed by the Christian West. 
And I think many Palestinian Christians still feel betrayed by the Christian West because of their blind support, unquestionable, to the state of Israel. We, as Palestinian Christians, I think, have been countering that narrative which denies the very existence of our people and their right to this land and their right to live equally and freely and with dignity. I can recall many initiatives and many theologians who start writing about this issue from the 1980s. I think the Nakba was a huge shock for people. It was a crisis that made people not think theologically and write theologically for a few decades. But in the 1980s, we start with Naim Atik and Jerry Khouri and Rafiq Khouri, Palestinian Christian theologians, who reconciled their identity, their national cause, and their religion, and they found an avenue how the Bible speaks to their reality. And because of their work, you start to see in the 1990s, early 1990s, the establishment of Sabil, uh, Ecumenical Center for Liberation Theology. You start to see Musalaha organization by Salim Munayyar and his attempt to reconcile young people's identity with their reality as Palestinian Christians who live in the state of what we call Israel. But later, in 2009 in particular, a huge move forward with Cairo's Palestine document. The first time you can see an ecumenical work. Ecumenical means like collaboration between different denominations in Palestine, including Greek Orthodox, Malachite Catholics, Syrians, um, Lutherans, Anglicans, writing and signing a document it speaks about the struggle of Palestinian people under the Israeli settler colonialism and defending their faith and their people based on the Bible and countering the argument of Christian Zionism. Around the same time, you know, there was um, discussions about how we can speak to evangelicals. In 2010, it was the launch of Christ at the Checkpoint Conference, which takes place every two years, which literally focuses on Western evangelicals who are influenced by default by Christian Zionist ideology and theology. And we try to speak to them and share our stories and our narratives. And as a Palestinian theologian myself, I believe our theology has a solid ground in faith, in the Bible, in philosophy, in humanity, even just looking at the humanity of not only ourselves, but even our enemies on the other side of the wall. How we can counter those settler colonial arguments, not to exclude the other, but actually to include them. One of the points that Kairos Palestine makes very clear, and I think it's one of the most important also conviction of Christ at the checkpoint, that in our pursuit of liberation, we want to liberate even our oppressors. Because we want to liberate our oppressors from their oppression. And how we can do that? With the logic of love, not hate. Hate never wins. Love only wins. And we understand this profoundly. And we carry it. You know, this is a Christian value for us, but also it's a human value that we need to, to keep hanging very tight into. Wow, that seems to me like a struggle, an internal struggle that you have to look at that checkpoint and see the soldier and say, you are oppressing me, but out of my love for you and for humanity in the world, I want to liberate you from your act of oppressing me because eventually you are also suffering from the fact that you are oppressing me. And that's a struggle, a challenge. And I'm sure there are other challenges that Christian Palestinians have because you are a minority here. And I think one of them is that a lot of Christians eventually are leaving when they have the opportunity to study and work abroad and they have a better future ahead and no blame there because this is very logic. Is that also something that as Christian community you are trying to deal with and are there ways to deal with that? Yes, that's one of the major threats to the existence of Christianity in Palestine. The migration that has been increasingly making alerts for the churches and the hitch of churches in Palestine. This year alone, I think the heads of churches in Palestine made two statements about this. And actually, they have been noticing that 
the Israeli settler colonialism and its suppression of the Palestinians is playing a major role in that. People are looking to live peacefully, have more uh, promising economic situations, which Israel has been the major factor in denying the Palestinian Christians and Palestinians in general that. Churches have been trying to, to convince people to stay, trying to provide some support. However, I think that churches, in as much as they try, it cannot surpass the Israeli amount of oppression that is not only physically heavy for the people, but even emotionally and psychologically. You know, you have to wake up and see the wall every single day. And it's, it's, it's not an easy thing to know that you are imprisoned. You have to wake every single day and read the news and you see that someone in the next town was killed or detained by the Israeli, and seeing mothers mourning their kids. So every single morning, not every single morning, every moment while living in Palestine, you have to, to struggle and to, to fight internally. And I think the emotional and the mental and psychological struggle is much heavier than the physical one, uh, what you see on the ground and harassment by the Israeli army. And the church tried to deal with that honestly not enough i think churches also have failed to speak to the realities of people on a daily basis in sunday sermons and their teachings it's been our responsibility as theologians palestinian theologians to write about this and to to speak to people reality if you read uh, for example uh, mondar isaac books on the other side of the wall, the other side of the wall. If you read Mitri Rahib's books, which promotes the Palestinian narrative, but at the same time, their theological, intellectual work has been very helpful for our students to relate their faith to their reality and see their faith as actually a liberating part from their socioeconomic and political situation. Yeah, and now we are approaching Christmas, and Christmas is generally supposed to be a happy time of the year where we are celebrating the birth of Jesus. And there is, of course, there is a lot of Western tradition around it with the trees and the lighting and the presents and the food. So how do you go into this coming season, Christmas season, with all the knowledge that we have now after listening to this podcast episode of challenges and difficulties? Wow, uh, I think Christmas is a season of remembering that God will interfere one day and God will break through and come to bring justice in unexpected ways. And this is what the term Kairos actually means. In the perfect time in history, when nobody have expected, God incarnated, God came. And he didn't come as an emperor or a king. He came as a child born in a humble family in Palestine, in a city that is, or a town, even a small town of Bethlehem, on the margins of history. And I think when we meditate on that part, gives us little hope. People light candles now, and one of the candles is hope. And I think hope is the hardest thing for Palestinians. So in this season, at least, we get to see a glimpse of hope for some time. And I think as the empire tried to kill down that hope in the first century, the empire still tried to kill down that hope in Palestinian Christian and Palestinians in general heart every Christmas season. Gaza this year, the Christians in Gaza and the people of Gaza are not getting permissions. I, I, I will not get to see my family for Christmas this year. You have thousands of people who are not getting reunited with their families. You have 20,000 people who are waiting to be unified with their loved ones. So what brings me hope to see that God in Christ lived through that with us. That's, that's a glimpse of hope that you see that God is in solidarity with the Palestinian people from the first century till today. And let me end with that note because always I get this question from Western people. 
when and where do you have hope? Palestinians don't talk about it. I think we have embraced hopelessness of hope. Uh, we have embraced that there is no hope that we can see, but we still believe in it. And I think that's all about their Christian faith. You know, it's just faith is to believe in the unseeable. And we continue to carry on with that, believing that we have a mission in this land. And this mission is to stay steadfast, be in an active act of sumud as part of our genuine faith in Christ and the Christmas story and and who we are the last 2000 years it's always good to end with a note of hope <laughs> yusuf thank you very much for your time i think that it was really interesting and i'm going to ask you afterwards to give me a couple of titles of books that i can add to the show notes of this podcast episode so that everybody who wants to read a little bit more and dive a bit more into this topic can do so and then i end with wishing you a very good Hopeful Christmas and a wonderful next year in Holland. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you and see you. And I hope people get to educate themselves more about Palestine and Palestinian Christians. What we really need is to be intentional about learning about Palestine. And that's, I think, is a very important starting point. And for this Christmas season, I hope that people would remember that Jesus was a Palestinian Jewish who fought the Roman Empire and the Roman colonialism.